Daylight, and uh, obviously this is... <laughs> I said that already. Oh, oh there we go. <laughs> uh, this is James. Um, I've got some notes here. I've written Titan, Hitter. Um, so obviously James is, uh, you know, one of the big names in the ultra endurance scene. Uh, incredible racer. And primarily we're here to talk about Silk Road, in particular this year's Silk Road, which was an amazing race to, to follow. Um, but I think to give some context to that, we want to look back at the last sort of two or three years um, and uh, everything that led up to that, which is quite important. Um, and we're going to play a film and I've got a load of questions, so uh, it should be good. But yeah, so um, James was a back to back TCR winner 2017, 2018. So maybe Shane's push over that because it's amazing. <laughs> um, and in 2019, he made the decision to switch to off-road. Um, his first event was Italy Divide, which was uh, in April 2019, which is effectively a gravel race, pretty hardcore, just a, a mere 1200K, 15,000 meters elevation. Um, and he was joint first place in that. But at the end of May that year, he, uh, that was his sort of baptism of fire and his first proper sort of mountain bike event, and it's worth mentioning at this point, he had literally ridden a mountain bike for two or three weeks beforehand, he just decided you're going to give it a go, it was the HT 550 uh, up in the Highlands, which is 550 miles, 16,000 meters of elevation, and a huge amount of hiker bike, just really uh, arduous terrain. Um, so, James, can you, Tell us a bit about that event because obviously it was quite transformational for you in terms of the bug of mountain biking. Um, we've got some pictures up here of the landscape to sort of help you through it, um, just to show you know, how severe it is, but go ahead. Yeah, uh, I don't know if anyone here has ridden the Highland Trail, anyone? No one, okay, cool. Uh, so it's 550 miles of mountain biking in Scotland. There is some tarmac in there, there's some gravel roads, but it also takes in some really tough sections, some hiker bikes. I uh, emailed the organizer, Alan, uh, a few times before the event in a sort of begging fashion to like, can you let me in, please let me in, I want to come and ride. And he, he knew I'd, I'd won the TCI, I didn't know what else I'd done. And I think in the end, he just sort of, you know, wanted to have a laugh and, uh, and let me in because you have to pass a pretty high bar to go there. Uh, and I ended up going, and it was a really, a really wet edition. I mean, on the scales of wetness, you go in Scotland, you go from really wet to really fucking wet, and it was probably really fucking wet. And um, there was only about eight or nine finishes in the end because we had to uh, cross some pretty deep rivers, and um, it, it rained for about three days straight, uh, you know, as it often does in Scotland. And eventually, I was one of those finishes. I finished in sixth, and it was. Um, an enjoyable experience for, for me. I, I, I don't think other people really enjoyed it, but it was, it was, um, it was a test. You know, I, I enjoyed the test of these things and I, I came sick and that was a passing of the test for me. I walked most of the mountain biking stuff in it because I didn't really know how to ride a mountain bike. I didn't know the difference between a dropper and suspension. I had no idea and I didn't even have a dropper. But this was sort of the um, igniting of a fire within me of, of mountain biking and enjoying uh, a challenge of new things and learning new skills. And it was really where I started to, to go on this journey into, yeah. into racing and riding off-road. So, September 2019, that was your, this was the, your first trip to Kyrgyzstan, the Silk Road race, your major focus for that year. Um, so when you'd made that decision to switch to off-road, you went, Silk, this is my event. And, just wind over to you the, to give some context. It is 1,895 kilometers, 37,000 meters of climbing, 4.2 times Everest, all off-road, at a highest point of 4,080 meters. And you finished fourth place, um, which was incredible. <laughs> Especially that there was a, there was a bit of an incident, which we're gonna, we're gonna talk about in a bit. But can you just give us a, an idea of, um, that landscape, which obviously you've been very drawn to and keeps pulling you back, but tell us about Kyrgyzstan and that experience. Yeah, so coming from racing the Transcontinental Race, which is on the tarmac and it's in Europe, and it's it's obviously very difficult, but it's it's not unimaginable. Going to Kyrgyzstan was almost unimaginable. I had never been anywhere in the stands or anywhere like this. I hadn't really been outside of Europe at this point in time. 
And it seemed like a, a, an unmanageable challenge for me, which I liked the idea of. And actually doing the Italy Divide and the Silk uh, and Highland Trail was a way for me to step into this and learn some skills and get some experience that I might need to go to Kyrgyzstan to show myself that it might actually be possible to go there and do this. I didn't have the sort of audacity to think that I could just go straight from one to the other. I needed a few stepping stones to get there. And um, they did give me the experience that I needed to go there. Scotland is a terrible place to ride a bike, really, because it just rains. And, and the conditions in Scotland are almost worse than Kyrgyzstan because of that sort of three, four degrees of raining is perhaps some of the most dangerous and most difficult weather to ride in, as you probably will know riding in London in winter. It's not very pleasant for any sustained period of time. In Kyrgyzstan, it was probably even worse. Uh, it was minus 15 for the majority of the first and second day. And then we went along the plateau at 3,000 meters for about 48 hours. And it was again about minus 15 and snowed up there. So it was tough from the beginning. And that year was a tough uh, year, especially with the terrain as well. We had a few really difficult sections and spending, it, for me, it was about 48 hours above 3,000 meters was, it made it difficult, especially when you were trying to like race it and ride it fast. You ended up riding at night through through these areas, and it was it was pretty bad. And I still have, I, I can remember everything race wise I've ever done. And there was this section um, going out to checkpoint three at uh, Kelsu, the, the, this beautiful lake. And I just remember slogging up this hill at about four in the morning. Uh, I thought I would have got to the checkpoint at about eleven. I eventually got there about 5 a.m. and you I was going outside. outside. Yeah, are you getting a few hours and is it all outdoors? Yeah, it's easiest. It's easiest. If you've got a good sleeping bag, it's okay. Minus 15. Yeah, with a good sleeping bag, it's okay. But the, the, it, it, it was wet for some reason, and I was going up this climb, and uh, it was just very muddy, and uh, it just went on and on and on. But Kyrgyzstan is it's a very very difficult place to to ride a bike, and it's an extremely difficult place to race a bike because it just demands so much. Um, of you and your your equipment, uh, mentally and physically. Was there any sort of uh, initial shock factor? Like this is this landscape, the size of the mountains, the altitude you're riding at. Is, or is that in your world? Is that something you deal with? No, it, it's not something I deal with. I, I went to Kyrgyzstan the first time in 2019, six weeks before the race, which is a nice luxury to have this time. And I spent four of those weeks touring around Kyrgyzstan, and I think I rode, I don't know, 3,000 kilometers, a few kilometers on the event route, and then I just went exploring, meeting the people, seeing some different mountains, some different places, because for me it was very important that before I was gonna try and race there, to understand the, the terrain, the topography, the people, the culture, the climate, and all of these things, so that when I tried to race, I knew what the weather might be doing, or what the valleys might be like, and, and these sorts of things, and also, I thought if I was going to go to a place so far flung away, I should actually spend some time there if I could. And to meet the people and, and, and take a bit, as well as like, uh, oh, to give back and meet the people and have this experience there that I could then go away and be an ambassador for, for kind of Kyrgyzstan rather than just flying in, doing the race and then leaving, which I think is a lot of just taking. Um, I wanted to learn about the culture and meet the people. And um, obviously, despite you know, the amazing fourth place, um, we touched on it a little bit ago, but on the sixth day, you know, uh, looking back, there was a, a bit of an unfortunate and rare incident, but, you know, for your own motivation, uh, it was, look, in the future, it was quite a big thing. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, maybe people have heard. Uh, so, I, I say I'm an ambassador for Kyrgyzstan, so I don't really talk about it because it's like a bad thing that happened that happens in, in London all the time. So, two, two people in the middle of the night, uh, like, assaulted me and robbed me in, in, on a mountain pass, essentially. Um, they, they were kind of fueled up on vodka, as people are in Kyrgyzstan. And yeah. uh, I don't make a big deal of it, not because it bothers me, although it has sat with me for a while. Um, but more because it just happens anywhere. So I, I, I descended back off the mountain after this and went to the checkpoint and decided if I was going to continue or not. And yeah. then I did continue. And uh, I, I, I managed to come forth for some way after this. Um, it, it happens. So uh, you stopped a little while, didn't you? And these uh, two guys on horseback. And um, yeah, how long were you, were you stationed me for? Uh, I don't, it, it happened about two in the morning. I, I, uh, I don't know, thirty-six hours or something. I spent, I spent the day with the Kyrgyz police, which I wouldn't recommend. If you ever robbed in Kyrgyzstan, just don't bother telling the police. It's a waste of time. They're, just, they're, they're worse than the robbers, to be honest. 
<laughs> okay, so that was sort of 2019. Um, 2020, obviously, we had we had COVID, which um, for a lot of people was uh, you know a very, very difficult situation. So many people here were affected in different ways by it. Um, obviously, uh, as an athlete, it affected you. Um, you had to train. There was no particular. A lot of the big events were cancelled, Silk Road, the HT, the Tour de Vite, these races didn't go ahead. Um, you had one race that year, which was um, Further Pyrenees. That's I had two, I did Atlas at the start of the year. It was kind of funny because we did Atlas, we came home and literally three days after getting back from Morocco in February 2020, the world just sort of shut down. So we were yeah. quite blessed to, to have done, to have been, yeah. Yeah. And in um, Further, you, you won that race. Um, oh, there, was, there was only 10 people there. So. <laughs> but of those 10 people, Christian Meyer, Lons Tan Dam, uh, and, you know, finished what, top 10 in the mountain stage in Tour de France? Yeah. yeah. Unbelievable riders. And to go there and to, to beat them, I mean, that, I think that shows the condition you were in at that point. Um, so that was your 2020. Um, moving forward to 2021, back to HT 550. Third place, yeah. extremely wet again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I think you were happy with that? Yeah, no, not really. But <laughs> I, it was a difficult year. Like, um, I was in really, really good shape when I went there. The best shape of my life, I think, because I'd, uh, I had finished at university and, uh, the year before, and I'd been training for over winter extremely hard. I was living in Spain by now and just, just working too hard. And I was, I've never been in such good shape. and. On the third day, my, my rain jacket sort of failed me, and uh, as things can happen in Scotland, and I got really wet, uh, sort of borderline hypothermic, and I made the decision, knowing how cold it gets at night time there, to, to stop and dry myself out rather than potentially risk something, because it's just a bike ride at the end of the day. Um, so it's, it wasn't a performance that was 100% of what I can give, although yeah. I was very near 100% physically, so it was really annoying um, is the polite way of putting it so it's definitely something that sits in in my book as unfinished because uh, it, there's potential there to, to do more and it was annoying to it, it's very rare that you can turn up to something being like a hundred percent because normally you have an injury or illness or something like this you never get to be on, on a very good day when you do something you just have to make do with what you've got but that happened to be a very good day and uh, thing thing got kicked yeah yeah so as per the previous years, 2019, Silk was your focus again. 2020 was cancelled. 2021, you travelled out to Kyrgyzstan in the September after the third place in the Highland Trail. And one of your friends, uh, who I know you were um, sharing taxis with, you had a dinner with him, he, he tested positive for COVID. And you made a decision after flying out there, training you know, all year for it, that you you couldn't and you shouldn't race. And tell yeah, us about that. A friend of mine was actually, he was volunteering and I hadn't seen him for a year in a while because he'd been touring on his bike, but he came to Kyrgyzstan because he was in Pakistan and came to volunteers. So we had dinner together, stayed at the hotel, got a taxi and I, I don't know, I was being stupid to be honest in, in, in hindsight because it was at the time of COVID. And, yeah, I keep myself for it, but uh, we all had to do a test the day before the event to make sure that no one had COVID because it was still a thing at this time. And if you're traveling in Kirk, you know, here, who cares now and then maybe, but there it's, it, it's a bit like, because you're going into these rural communities, you, you can't be taking, you know, COVID out there because it's not, it's not morally responsible really if you, if you potentially have it. And having traveled there, your chances of, you know, getting sick were, were quite high. And he tested positive. Um, I tested negative at that time, but I was kind of concerned for two reasons. One, I'd spent quite a bit of time with him in close contact and I didn't want to uh, take that out there and perhaps give it to people while I was out there. And secondly, I had had like asthma and breathing problems when I was younger and I'm, I, I'm more sensitive to, to getting quite sick over things and I, I know what doing these things do to my body even when I'm 100% healthy. And for me, there was, just, there was no choice but to not start because the potential of putting myself in a hole for three days, feeling okay, then getting quite sick, and it would, there's, there's not the best medical infrastructure in Kyrgyzstan, I didn't know what the consequences would be in the short term there, but also long term to like my my health on on potentially having long COVID or my, you know, my physical and athletic ability. So it was, it was, a, it was, a, it was either a short term, oh yeah, I'll do this because I'm here, or a long term, like I need to protect myself for the future. And so there was, I knew within a second that it was just not even viable. And yeah. so I spent a, 
a week uh, sitting around while everyone, while everyone was racing. I spent a week sitting in a hotel room, uh, just making sure that I didn't go positive before I flew home. And then spent another six days in my van because my wife was pregnant at the time and I couldn't really risk doubly risk giving it to her. So yeah, it was a pretty shit time. <laughs> yeah, so it was a huge decision because, um, you know, seeing here, you know, James, you're, you're a full-time athlete and, um, you know, you're being paid by your sponsors. It's a, it's a tough life. It's, it's a point, no, it's you're, you're training and, and <laughs> you say it's a point, you know, you've got to go out there and race these races and, you know, the distance we've talked about, you know, it's, it's arduous and, um, you know, you focus on these and you have it in your mind when you're out training that you're going to race. And to go out there to Kyrgyzstan and you know to, to pull out is, is a huge big deal. And I was quite admirable of the fact that you know you talked openly in social media about um, that you you know you've been to see a therapist because you know you, the, the sort of the sense of loss that you've had really. And she said, well, you, you have had a big loss. You've been training for two years for for this event, and at the very last minute, it's been taken away from you. Um, I remember talking to you around this time, we were having chats and, you know, and... Um, head angles and bottom brackets. Head angles and bottom brackets, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, for a while you were saying, oh, um, I'm done with silk, uh, it's, I'm going to do tour divide, and there was this very clear mindset that you were sort of over it. And there was almost this switch point, I remember, with James going, there's unfinished business. And it was this idea of unfinished business, and that became your focus, get back out to Silk and race it. So can you just tell us a little bit about how you felt in that period, the sort of that feeling of loss, and how you, in your mind, re-motivated yourself? Yeah, it's difficult because there are, there are two things. Firstly, the incident when I went there the first time was, uh, was, was assaulted or robbed. You know, we had a pretty hectic situation and, and they were armed so it wasn't particularly pleasant and that's lived with me for a long time afterwards. Yeah. I've been robbed a couple of times in my life like pretty badly and that was it was a bad one. And it took a lot for me to get over that to go back there to ride through the night in these remote places and deal with that. And I and I sort of got through that, went back a second time and then this whole COVID clusterfuck thing happened and I had to find a way through that. Um, and I was sort of just a bit fed up and pissed off at this point with this event because I've been there twice. It's a long way to go, especially in this day and age of going places. It's a difficult place to be. And then I put in sort of six, seven months solely on this event, you know, doing what we do. We don't have much opportunity to race every year. You can do it maybe once or twice at 100% and beyond that, no. So, and I choose to do it at 100% when I do it because otherwise I, I, that's how I do things. And so I was just pissed off and fed up with, with going all this way and it not happening. Um, and it took me a long time, the second time, to be like enthusiastic for going there again. And for some reason one day I just sort of woke up and thought, you know, I don't know, fuck this, I want to I win that one. Yeah. It's kind of as simple as that really. Well that really became a motivation for you, I remember, I remember it. And from then on it was just this absolute focus and your positivity just changed in terms of you know, I'm going to go out there again, I'm going to go out there again, I'm, I'm going to try and win it. Um, so moving to 2022, you know, obviously the year we're in, HT550 again was your sort of, uh, I suppose, preliminary event, Silk being the focus in September, and you've been out riding the hole quite, quite a lot, and I got a call a week before the event. That's about four, four days. <laughs> four days before the event, and you've broken your elbow. <laughs> Which I was already, you know, we were, you know, um, we it's were what, it's what happens you. when uh, roadies go mountain biking. It does. <laughs> and uh, but obviously that was, a, that was a huge frustration. Um, but you, you know, you kept really positive. It didn't really affect you. You had silk in your mind as, as the main focus. And that leads us up to this year's silk. And about a week, two weeks before the race, Lloyd, who uh, is at the back filming, he went out and went to James's home in the Pyrenees and he filmed with you about how you were feeling. We're going to play that film now and then get stuck into talking about this year's race after the film. Already? The scale of Kyrgyzstan is, you know, you just stand there in the valley and you look up and you look up and you look up and you crane your neck so far it hurts. <laughs> yeah. 
My name is James Hayden and I'm an ultra endurance cyclist. Do you want to be a bike packer or do you want to be an ultra endurance? Yeah. Ultra endurance cyclist. I think, I don't know, I don't really care for it. I just I like riding long distances fast. The Silk Road Mountain Race is uh, something like 1,800 kilometers, 35 to 40,000 meters of off road bikepacking, ultra endurance cycling event in, in Kyrgyzstan. It was everything I was looking for. It was just harder, it was a lot to learn and I really enjoyed learning things, um, all new skills. It was just a challenge that I needed again um, to see, to test myself. It's rough enough all the time that it's gonna wear you down and it's, it's very rough at other times that it will just leave you standing still. I don't think he is purposefully trying to make it hard, it's just that that's the way it is if you wanna to go to the places that are worth going to and you pay the price by having to go the tough way. Yeah, it's worth it. I've been there twice now and both times like something's gone wrong that's pretty much outside of my control, although I take responsibility. It's a case of like, when I start something, I can't sort of cross it off as finished until I've done an effort that I'm happy with or achieved like my best that I'm happy with. There's a lot of pressure for me now before the start of an event that I didn't used to feel in the past because of like the calamities that I've had. And so I just want to start and once I'm going, then like I'll just relax a lot and I'll just feel really like really good. And then I can just ride into it. I think when things are going bad, for sure it weighs on you. There's no way it doesn't weigh on you. But it's up to you to be able to deal with that weight and manage it in a constructive and positive way rather than just letting it grind you down and like adjusting my training so that it's more like fluid and being a bit more relaxed and just giving myself the space to like let injuries recover and the space to like remove sort of demands on being exceptional when I go to events so that I can just find my feet again naturally is, is important and not like pressuring it. When races haven't been going well and you haven't been doing your best or you're not super fit you've had injuries and illnesses and all these other things and you're not feeling great and you know that like you're here like, and, and you, that's that's where you should be, could be, and you're all the way down there, it's like it just knocks you back and knocks you down and, and to try and get back there is like, it just you, you're looking up that hill and you're seeing the top being so far away and there's no like jet if there's nothing, you're just gonna have to climb every step to get back to the top and hope that you don't get knocked back down on the way. It's taken me longer to get to where I wanted to be than I thought it would, that I expected and that I hoped, and that's like a mixture of just sort of bad luck, you know, mistakes of my part, and then and then COVID, and it is what it is. But it's been a drawn out thing. But I think when I when I get there, and I and I you know like stamp authority that I feel is my best, it's going to feel really good. You know, people talk about this type one and type two final. Okay, there are hard moments, I'm not gonna lie, but I enjoy what I do. I love what I do. And you know, when I'm out there on the road and I'm just pushing myself and I'm having fun, there's this place that I can go to that, that, that just isn't accessible at other times. There's something else. I do my best. There's no other answer than that. Well done to Lloyd there, um, from Fairlight. We literally sent him out a week before the race and he filmed that, he edited it. He doesn't have a he does a lot of photography, great photography, doesn't do a lot of filming. I think that's incredible what he came up with um, in such a short space. Um, I love that bit at the end when you say, um, I, I do my best, you know, that's what I do. And you know, that is you, you know, you can see it in you, the integrity, you give it everything. And I think you have to in the world that you exist in. Um, now, you haven't been to Silk for three years when we took that, and you could really sense that in the film how important it was to you. And you went out there and you got a second place and probably the, the most exciting ultra race I watched in, in a long time. It was incredible. You know, it was literally a neck to neck, to neck finish by the end of it. It was absolutely insane to, to watch. Um, 
you finish the course I talked about earlier, you know, that sort of 1900 kilometers in seven days, six hours, five minutes, averaging 262 kilometers a day, 5,100 meters of climbing, so that's you know, more than a dragon ride on the road, and this is all off-road, it's incredible stats really. Um, can you, first of all, tell us, you know, going into this race, what were your learnings from three years previous? What were you going in there thinking, I want to do differently? Were there any things that you sort of, um, you know, tactically-wise, you knew straight from the off you were going to change, sleep, or whatever? Tell us about that. Yeah. It's, I think it's just a learning thing from the past. I'm 31 now, and when I used to race on the road, I was 24, 25, and it's a maturity and a, a longevity sort of thing. And I, I realized in the end of the day, you can't win all the time. I, I got very lucky in the first few years that I did this, that I did win all the time. And it, it sort of logged into a full sense of security that um, it was easy to win. And I learned the hard way over the past three years that um, actually winning is quite difficult. And if you are winning, you're, you, it, it's perhaps more luck than serendipity. And it's more luck than just you being the best because you need everything, you need all these plates and stars to align and that doesn't happen very often in what we do because there's so much that can go wrong. And then over the past year I sort of changed my thought process, philosophy, dynamic going into these things and rather than oh I want to win or I want to do this or I want to achieve that, just to, as, a, as I finished the, the, the film, just to, I just want to do my best. And if you take that as a measure of your success, then you control your success rather than your success being controlled by outside variables or other people. And with that, I can come second or fourth or I can come last and I can still walk away going, yeah, I did my best in the situation that I was presented with. And you can walk away in a positive mindset. And actually going into this event, I set myself three goals. The, the first one was to have fun. And I said this one of having fun because I, uh, I, I yeah, um, I, I went and did an analysis. Uh, I'm, I'm an engineer, sort of by, by mind, and, and I don't know, I sit somewhere, and I love doing analysis with Excel spreadsheets. And uh, who needs an Excel spreadsheet for analysing your mind? But anyway, <laughs> and, and I realised that the, the, the common factor in the events where I had the best success and achieved the most out of myself was that I was having fun. And it was often when everything had gone wrong and there was no pressure to, to achieve a certain result and there was no stress on my shoulders or expectation on me that that was all removed and I just had fun. And when I had fun, I could access this place that I couldn't normally access and the performance level was off the charts. And so I went in and set the goal to have fun. Because if the goal was to have fun rather than to, to win or to even do my best, then if I just had fun, that would happen by sort of uh, a natural, natural flow. So my first goal was to have fun. My second goal was to finish. I think in these things, especially when they're so difficult, like in Kyrgyzstan, that your goal shouldn't be to first, second, third, fourth, or to ride 400 kilometers a day, or to ride 16 hours, or to sleep for us. It's just to finish. Like if you can just finish, even if it's after the party or after everyone else has gone home, you've still finished. No one cares how long it took in the end of the day. If you finish, damn good for you. So if I had fun and I finished, that was a success for me. Um, yeah. I had a third goal, which was, uh, I wrote it in a way, was that if my body allowed me, I would race. Because I found in these things that sometimes you can go there as fit as you possibly are, as mentally strong, as motivated, as committed, and with the best bike and everything. But sometimes your body just says, no, no thank you, it's not happening. I don't know why. Um, I, I've tried to control my body in the past with my mind and sometimes or even my mind with my body and it just doesn't work. And so I set the, the goal that if my, if my body allowed me to race, I would race. And for the first five or six days, it sort of was there and it wasn't really compliant. But uh, after about the, well, I don't know, the first five days, on, on the sixth day, my body started to comply and it, it, I just, it just wanted to race. And it wasn't even... I didn't even have to make it. Suddenly I just started pushing harder on the pedals and everything just clicked into place. Um, and then it just happened. So you were quite, you, you had some sickness, didn't you, in those first days? And uh, I don't know, to all of you watching Atlas and, and Silk, it's quite a common story that people get ill. And um, did you know from sort of previous experience that you were going to get through it, you know, because you were sort of sitting a little bit behind the pack at the front and we're thinking, well, what's, what, you know, 
or somewhere, James, here, or we just, you had this illness. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so I was riding really well at the start, actually, a lot stronger and faster than I expected to or even wanted to, but it just came naturally without any effort. And I actually remember turning to uh, Ernie, Ernie Lechuga, who's sort of from the US and a kind of friend of mine, at one point and going, are, are, we, are we riding fast or not? Um, because when you're in really good shape and you've freshened off for a week or so, you can't actually tell how fast you're riding if you don't have a power meter and a heart rate, which I don't, because I don't want to know when I'm racing. And I, I said to him, are we pushing or are we not? And he said, yeah, we're pushing. And I said, oh, great. <laughs> uh, and, and then, and then it, uh, kind of, yeah, right off. But, so I was riding really well. Um, uh, but then we, we started at midnight and about 7 or 8 a.m. in the morning when the sunlight came up, I just started having diarrhea. And I spent the rest of the day like, riding along up to 4,000 meters, shitting myself at the side of the road. <laughs> I mean, I won't, I, won't, I won't lie and make it sound better than it is, because it was the fact. And every 20 minutes, I'd have to shit myself. And every hour, I'd have to sit down and just try and gather some energy back up. And in a period of 12 hours, I lost about six hours to the people that I was riding with at the start. So it wasn't great. I didn't feel too bad. It was just I was low on energy. I couldn't eat while this was happening. I was drinking lots to try and rehydrate, and then had to waste a lot of time. I, I, I don't think I was really sick from the food. I have quite a sensitive stomach. I have like IBS, for anyone that has IBS, and to some bowel syndrome. Don't that. And it messes, it messes with my stomach, it makes it quite sensitive. And I think the dietary change, just from coming up from home, where I eat really well, really clean, nice food, to go to Kyrgyzstan, and I actually ate um, like freeze-dried food for the four days I was there before the event, so that I didn't eat the food that was there. But even that's not particularly great food, so it's just this change. And, there's nothing that can be done about it. I just have to get through it and make the best of it. And I knew that if I could get over this pass of 4,000 meters, well, you know, not shitting myself, then it was then downhill, and then there was a lot of tarmac for another 12 hours after that. And if I could get over it, down, sleep well that first night, I could probably recover into that second day because I wasn't super real, and it worked out as I thought it would. Um, what sort of um, sleep are you taking in those first days? Is that planned out, or you're seeing how you feel, how your body feels? Yeah, I think it's kind of, um, it's a beginner thing to plan your sleep and what you're going to do. And I think you, maybe if you are a beginner, you should set like a minimum, like oh, I need to sleep five hours, which I would say is when well, Silk Road should definitely sleep five hours a night. When you get more advanced, you can then play with it a bit um, because I really understand how my body feels. So that first night I slept five and a half, maybe six hours because I knew my body was pretty trashed and it, need, it needed a rest. Yeah. From there, it was it was less and less actually as the events went on, and I started to feel better and better. And then, yeah, nothing. So it's really noticeable. Um, obviously, the dot watching you, you started pulling that distance back, and there was four of you that um, I suppose sort of broke away. There was still there was yourself and I'd say the others dropped back, and we broke. The others dropped back. <laughs> maybe maybe that's maybe that's the case. Um, but there was four of you that sort of um, by the sort of mid race, I'd say were. We're out clear. There was a couple of couple of guys that, that dropped away, and then there was yourself and Sofian with Sofian out ahead. If we jump to checkpoint three, which um, I think you said big, it was big jump, big jump. <laughs> but there was about I think you said you know, it was the end was so exciting. There was maybe 24 hours of racing in your mind, knowing from previous experience that CP3, I've got about 24 hours of a day's sleep, and you rolled into there, and you could see from the stamps that you were about one and a half hours behind Sofiane. Yeah, I do think it's worth going back a bit because Checkpoint 3 was really late in the race this year. It was only 24 hours from the finish, give or take an hour or so. Uh, as, uh, uh, you know, 200 kilometers is 24 hours, is there? But it was really quite late, but at Checkpoint 2, which was on Sankul Lake, which was maybe three days from the finish, I arrived there and I was in you know, second place there as well. But I actually arrived at like 8 in the evening and I made this decision there to stop and sleep at the checkpoint because I hadn't stopped and slept inside. How far were you behind at that point? Did you remember uh, looking at them? You weren't sure. Yeah. I, to me, it was far enough away from the finish I couldn't give a shit because it's, <laughs> it's too far away. I, I, I don't check a tracker or care or anything during the event because you just got to do your best yourself if you're going as fast as you can. But I saw us in second and I thought, oh, that's nice because this guy had been out in front a long way and blown up. And then it was just so bad and I knew that. And, and the others weren't particularly far behind, but I stopped and slept there for four hours, had a shower. I actually only slept for two because I woke up and felt really awake and I just laid there, as yeah. often happens when you try and sleep for a long time, you're well awake. Um, 
but then from there I left like really refreshed and that, I think that was a really important step in the race for me to take that moment to, to, to have a shower, to just and then sleep in a real bed rather than just sleeping out in my sleeping bag. Just gross. having a, I take it having a shower wouldn't be a normal thing you'd do in, in those sort of races, was that a really... I think it's quite important, it's something that's seven days long, you've got to look after yourself at times and, and some people think that doing these things like that is wasting time but actually it buys you time back because then maybe you don't get problems or, or you just feel better, you feel more energized. Sleeping in a bed is so much better than sleeping outside. Although I slept a lot worse than I did when I was outside, so I didn't bother coming out again. But it was leaving from there, we had to go back over the uh, over the mountains from, from uh, Izikul Lake up over and around to Sonko, and it was a real long stretch around from there. But I felt good for it, I'd, I'd resupplied well, and I knew those roads as well because we'd raced them three years ago. And I think that was quite a strong point for me. I knew what was to come, I knew what to expect. I knew the final pass, um, Shamshi, uh, yeah. and so I was really quite excited from there. And I actually, I felt good at that point. And it's, it's that point where I really started feeling good. And uh, although I do remember actually having a power lap, um, I, left the, I left the checkpoint about 2 a.m. and I had a power lap about 7 a.m. So <laughs> maybe I didn't feel as good as I remember, but yeah. <laughs> We, we, you, you asked about checkpoint three though, but I think it's important to set, set the scene that I was feeling good at that point and rested. I got to checkpoint three, which is Songkhu Lake. If anyone's been to Kyrgyzstan, it's this really beautiful lake at 3,000 meters. And you have all the, the shepherds up there in the, in the summer. And I got there about six in the morning and they have, a, as Nelson does, he has a, like a checkpoint sheet and you can see what time someone signed in. And I saw that Sofan was an hour and a half ahead, and this was the first time I really actually paid attention to that. So you didn't know? I knew it was out there, but I, it was far enough or I wasn't really, I was going as fast as I could anyway, so I wasn't really worried. But at this point I saw it was an hour and a half ahead and I thought, nah, fuck, we've got not too far to go, but it's far enough that if he's pushed really hard, from past experience, I know that he'll slow down and I can still have energy, and I might be able to catch him. So from that point, it was, um, I remember leaving the checkpoint. I didn't waste any time, I just left, and I just remember Songkul, as you ride around Songkul Lake, it's about 40, 40 maybe 30 kilometers, of just this really undulating, tough terrain. You look on the map and you think, oh, that's gonna be nice, quite, quite a nice, pleasant ride around the lake. Just goes up and down and up and down, and it just drags for hours and hours. But I just started pushing really hard on the pedals without without even cognitively thinking about it. My body just wanted to race. And this was a really big moment where like, I achieved that third goal of my body just allowing me to race. And I was just having fun riding my bike hard. Um, so that was, until that moment in your mind, you weren't racing, you were sort of adhering to the other two. You were always racing. Uh, it would be <laughs> sort of arrogant to sit here and say, I'm oh, in second place in this like really hard race where third place was fucking ages behind, that I wasn't racing because obviously I'm pushing hard, um, uh, but I'm competing with myself and my own head rather than competing with other people. And I think that's a really important distinction for people to, to learn. And I made the mistake in the early days of going to these events and trying to race other people, and, and it is a mistake. You can use other people to perhaps pull and push you along, but in the end of the day, you can only race against yourself and the best that you can achieve. And if you're not going as fast as you can achieve just by internal motivation, that's something you should probably work on yourself. And if you end up competing with other people, you can end up making bad decisions that actually end up slowing you down versus the pace that you could have attained if you were just working to your own rhythm and your own sort of schedule that is best for you because everyone needs to do different things. Everyone needs to sleep different amounts, eat different amounts, ride different amounts. And so you have to work to your body and not someone else's. And so if you try and race a pack of people, you're going to make mistakes for what your body needs. So I was working to my body. But at that point, I really started, I still worked to my body, but I pushed the absolute limit of what I could achieve personally. So if you can't do that for eight days before anyone says, why didn't you do that from day zero? It's just not possible. <laughs> So on that last day, we talked about you going through checkpoint three, and you know we were all watching the dots like crazy at home, and uh, you know it was pretty clear that um, you guys got close. And first thing I asked you about, we spoke, you know, how close were you? And just tell us about those sort of um, that section where you really started to reel him in, and just how close you got. 
Yeah. Yeah, to come back from that, we had to go over Shamshi Pass, which is about 3,700 meters. Um, and it's, you ride up from the village of Shamshi, and you can ride for like three hours or so, and then you ride to about 2,500 meters. And from 2,500 meters, you have to, uh, you have to hike to 3,700. And it's, it's not a particularly difficult hike at times, but it's just a long drag, and it's quite steep, and it's like lush. Uh, rock for a lot, so it's quite demanding physically. And the last, I don't know, 150 meters of uh, elevation, not um, distance, are really quite tough, and you end up pushing your bike for 10 steps, stopping, and then, you know, having an internal debate about how many this meters. This was at night, wasn't it? Most, a lot of it. Um, the final bit for me was at night, yeah. And I, I came down, and then there was a big old landslide in the valley that wasn't on the map, so I wasn't expecting it. So I had to find my way around this landslide. Like the scale of this landslide was, you, you know, you're talking like a, a five-story building sort of landslide of rock that's come down. But then you have to, I had to walk down to the riverbed in the valley, walk along the riverbed for about 500 meters, then walk back up, then walk back down, walk along the riverbed, then walk back up, and then the rivers on this descent were really flowing because of the rain and they were sort of up to my waist and flowing pretty hard. So it was a really hard descent, and I was, I knew at this time that I, he wasn't far ahead, and I knew that I'm maybe a bit more bold and experienced in this sort of terrain, so I was really pushing down this descent as I could, and I didn't fuck around with any of the rivers, I just, I just went straight through, I didn't stop to think, oh, what's the best route, or how do I get through this safely, I just went, I just went straight through, sticking my bike on my back, and, this is a bit like the Scotland experience and, and the, the theories and things. I, I, I'm okay to do this, but I was taking some risks to How catch it. How deep was it? Uh, up to my waist and, and flowing hard, you know? And I'm like 185 centimetres, so they were deep. And they were quite long as well. But I got down to the bottom eventually, and the descent was... I've done it before, and it was a lot longer and rougher than I remember. And I got down eventually and uh, got some phone signal, checked the tracker and saw that uh, his track was still pinging in the village that I was in, but like 10 minutes ago. So I knew he was not far up ahead, and I, I then just was like, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to ride. Um, and I, I didn't really have any food left at this time. I'd hoped to have got there earlier and resupplied in the village. Uh, but I didn't have time to mess around, so I just started riding. And, and I checked the tracker again, and I worked out from times and distances on the tracker that he was about 8 kilometers, 9 kilometers ahead. And I thought, we, we had about, actually, a hundred, maybe it was 80 to 100 kilometers left at this time, but it was more or less all tarmac from here. There were two climbs that were probably about five or 600 meters in elevation up, which doesn't sound too bad, but when you're at this point, it's, it's, it's quite a long way, I can assure you. After 1,800 kilometers of racing. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and then it was 30 kilometers or so down to Bishkek, and I knew if I didn't catch up with him before the, the end of the second climb, that I'd never catch him on the downhill into Bishkek. And I used to, uh, I used to do time trialing quite a lot, so I, I'm quite familiar with this sort of riding. And, and for me, it was just like the old days, just time trialing again. Although you're probably really not going very fast at all because you've got no energy left. Um, and, and so I was just doing this, and I checked the tracker every sort of 20 minutes intermittently just to see if I was gaining on him, which, which I was. And, and, and uh, about halfway up, a bit above the second climb, so you went up a real long climb, down a small bit, and then up the second climb, which is probably only about 300 meters or something. Um, maybe like Box Hill, for anyone that's familiar with it, it's probably like that. And about halfway, three quarters of the way up, I, 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 there was a double switch back, and I saw his tail light. It was obviously a bicycle tail light um, up on that second switch back. And at this point, I knew that there wasn't that long left on the climb, and if I wanted to catch him from the top, I had to like ride even harder than I was just to get there. And so I really just was riding super hard, and I did this for about 10 minutes, and then uh, I just, for some reason, I wasn't really making any headway into it, into this tower, like a little bit, but not much. And all of a sudden, I just sort of, as, as they say, like the lights went out, and I just pulled to the side of the road and sort of collapsed off my bike on the side of the road. There was actually nothing left in me. Um, was that because of the so the, the tail light, which you can imagine that that must have been a massive motivator? And was there a bit of you that was like, okay, I can see it, I'm not going to go too hard, or was it just I'm going after it? No, uh, I mean I was already going pretty full on from the time that I left that village, like three hours, two hours before. 
But when I saw the tail, I, I went, I don't know, I went even harder than I could have imagined. And I, I was already absolutely blown at that point because I had no food for hours. And I didn't actually have water, and I filled up with water from like this drainage ditch that I didn't filter because I didn't want to waste time filtering this water. So, yeah, I paid the price for that one afterwards. And, um, and that was pretty horrible, but I just had nothing left in me. I'd, I'd given everything, and I had nothing. And then I was just done. Uh, like, there was, there was as, as strong as my mind was, there was nothing there physically left to give. And uh, I just, I just stopped. I had to stop for about 20 minutes and just, yeah, I'd, I'd take a deep breath. Because I had no food still, so I still had to get 40k to the finish. <laughs> so one of the things um, when we got watching at home, and yeah, the updates a little bit slow at times, and a lot of us from Fairline, I'm not sure whether we were watching it like mad on our phones. And you posted sort of from nowhere. You haven't posted a huge amount during the race, but this story that went up. It's not much ghost. I can imagine. It's good. <laughs> this story went up, and it was just a black screen with a little flame emoji in the middle. And I was flapping around, going, what the hell does he mean? Is he burnt out? Is he lighting the fire? Is he setting a fire? Burning himself? I had no yeah, idea. I would have done. <laughs> and Jake, what was that about? When, what, because it was... It was close to the end, there. What was that? What was that? Tell us what that emoji meant. <laughs> uh, it was just the potential to catch him. I think it was. I posted it just after the village because I had a phone signal there, and I was just like, "Oh, you know, I, I know I'm so close. I think I can do this." Give us a good insight that you were sort of full gas at that point, and you were like, "I'm going to do this." Uh, yeah. <laughs> so you were in second place, and it's just amazing that it came. It was so close at the end after 900k, all that climbing. It was really amazing to watch. Um, what were your emotions at the end, you know, in terms of um, happy, frustration? What were you thinking? I was, I was, I was satisfied. Um, I did my best, and I was really satisfied. Couldn't have done any more. Uh, yeah, I was, I, was, I was really pleased. Yeah. It was good to finish, you know. It's such, it's such a hard event that, that even for me, I'm like, oh, damn, I'm, I'm happy I just finished that thing, you know. And in retrospect, you know, how do you how do you uh, how do you feel about it now? Pride, regret, frustration at the illness or at that sort of time fired, class fired up. fired up. Yeah. No, it's it's really nice after three shit years. Like I had a couple of really bad injuries and things to just go there to have fun, to 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 do my best and and to be able to race. Like I left that meeting all my goals, and now I'm going into it to like I feel I know that I'm back to where I can be. I know that I'm as good as I can be or could be in my head, like it's not a fucking delusion. And uh, I just want to get training again and go racing. Unfinished business, again. Yeah, always. <laughs> <laughs> um, as we've just sort of talked about the event, we've got some, some more questions, um, sort of general about mindset, training, um, stuff that's not specifically about Silk Road. Does anyone have any questions regarding the event itself? One at the back there, you have to shout out, I think. I think that is a good question. I think the answer is that, like, you know, I used to race on the road and then I got quite bored with it um, because I, I sort of ticked it off and completed it in my book. Uh, and so I started racing off road, and the races that I race off road just get harder and harder. And then I start doing my own challenges and doing my own rides and making my own routes. I then go and set times on and just going off on my own adventures that I don't really tell anyone about. They're just harder and harder. And I've got it in my brain right now that I want to like make an enduro mountain bike bike packing uh, race and do that like myself. So I just keep like stepping the level up, and, and I want to take up like schema this winter and do some schema and bike stuff. So it's just like I just keep pushing the limits of what's achievable in, in my head. Um, so yes and no is the answer. Yeah, I get bored, but I keep pushing it. Uh, yeah, just over there. Uh, you won TTR twice. You can do it again. Oh, good question. <laughs> Honestly, no. Uh, and I think it's a complex answer, and, it, and it's an answer that, like, it's sort of, I, uh, the, the honest thing is I don't ride on the road anymore. I actually don't really enjoy it. Um, and, and I don't, I've had so many, like, I've been knocked off my bike so many times by cars, and I've had so many friends that have been killed by cars. I just don't see the need to, to put myself in that position. I can find the enjoyment from it. And I have moved to somewhere where I don't need to do it. 
so that I can enjoy the sport I love doing and I, I enjoy mountain biking so much it's just like it's not a need for me and doing a free route event like where you make your own route and, you, and I'm, if I want to do very well at it and like try to win I'd have to route on the fastest roads across Europe and that's not great in my head either for enjoyment of just like going to the nice places or be just in a safety thing. The only way I'd do it again would be like, oh, I'm not coming here to try and win, I'm coming here to have fun, and I'm gonna make a really route, fun route, like like Miko does a Rio, and go to like the nice passes and go the back roads. That would be the only way I'd do it in my head. And I think there's space to try and develop that sort of thing where there's not a demand to necessarily like go super fast, but it's like who can do the most fun route, who can get the most elevation, who can go to the most fun places. Like, you know, why can't we change the sport a little bit and do it like that, rather than like, I'm just going to take the fastest roads to, to Romania and, and, and Bulgaria and, you know, not see the great things and risk my safety for, for some, you know, validation of my, my ability. It's not necessary. It's like a really inhospitable place and, you know, endurance itself is like, is, is suffering, but that's what it translates to. But what makes Kyrgyzstan and other bikepacking events where you're off-road, that much more of dealing where you're having to push your bike and load it up. So there's no argument, right? The bike packing is where you do it because you've got a bike drive your bike, bike tour, you do it because you want to travel to bike bike. Do you see Kyrgyzstan and HT being a challenge, but when does it become a, a burden as well? Because you don't get to enjoy the sensations of riding a bike. I think Kyrgyzstan is only inhospitable if you don't understand how to make it hospitable. And if you spend enough time there or time in these places, you can understand how to make them hospitable. It's always going to be difficult, but it, you don't need to suffer. And I didn't suffer one minute in Kyrgyzstan this year. I enjoyed every, every moment out there. I was never too hot, never too cold, never, never unhappy. Um, I was hungry at one point because I didn't take enough food, but that's my fault. So it doesn't have to be inhospitable. How do you... I don't know, it's just tough, isn't it? At the end of the day, I enjoy doing things that are tough. But like, yeah, you might have to push your bike up to 4,000 meters, but then you get the view for 4,000 meters and you get the descent. And it's just, do you enjoy pushing it up or not? If you don't, then maybe you stick to the road. If you really want to go to places where it's just you, your bike and nature, then you're gonna do that. And, you know, for me, where I ride, where I live, like, I, I see eagles, I see, you know, all sorts of animals, I see deers, I see incredible things because I'm out in nature. But if you stick to my time, I can miss all these things. Sure, it might be better hiking, but I enjoy being able to travel long distances, and so sometimes I have to hike, and sometimes I can ride, but I can see more, and it's, it's just a thing. And, yeah, you can pick easier routes if you want. I don't, uh, yeah. I don't know, you go to places that are amazing, that's why. Any more questions? Uh, go on, there you go. Are you ever chased by the shepherd's dogs? Like, this is my biggest fear, I think. Oh, uh, was I ever chased by, like, uh, shepherd's dogs? Like, um, Caucasian, massive, the dogs here. Yes, yes and no. <laughs> honestly, honestly they, 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 they see you on a bicycle and they think you're like a threat. If you get off your bicycle and put your bicycle down or walk next to bicycle, they identify you as a human and that you're not an issue. So that's the honor, with a, it's all you need to do. It's just walk next to your bicycle and they see you as a, as a human. So I, would, I wouldn't worry now. I'd be more worried about the cars. Uh, I think there's a chap just over here. Uh, some of the riders reported quite negative interactions with the population. Parts of Kyrgyzstan this year. I, uh, yeah, I mean, do you, what do you think the effect of the race on the population is? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, th this year the event started in Osh, which is down in the southwest of Kyrgyzstan, and it's quite a different place, and it's a lot more impoverished than other areas. There's a lot of like, there's, the industry is quite different down there, and in Kyrgyzstan there is a lot of like drinking anyway, you know, um, because it's. Yeah, because I don't fully understand the reasons why. Um, it was in this area around Osh, in the small villages where there used to be mining and things that there isn't work anymore, that there was these negative interactions. I didn't have any, although I have had them in the past. It's a shame. I, I don't think the event will go there again because of it. What do I think the, the impact of the event on the country is? Generally, I think it's really positive, you know. I've had so many positive experiences and I've had so many sort of positive experiences back from people. I think obviously from tourism, it, it, it is really great putting money uh, and, you know, experiences in, into the country there is it, good. 
honestly, I don't feel qualified to fully answer the question um, because I, I, I don't really know. I haven't asked people there, but my interactions on a personal level with people have always been quite positive and that they've enjoyed you know, meeting people, taking the time to meet people. And I think it benefits the country as a whole. Any other questions? Yeah. Is it possible to train for something like the TCR while holding down a day job? And if so, how? Yeah, I... I uh, the two times that I won, I was at university, um, and I know that's kind of easy, but I, I, uh, I also worked very hard at university, and I didn't train particularly hard. I trained about 12 hours a week when I was doing that. I had a bit more time in the summer to train, so if you could flex a couple of months in the summer to do more hours in the week, but I did probably about 12 hours a week over winter. I did do a great degree in engineering and worked very hard. The second time, I was actually doing a, like a placement year, working full time, and I worked extra hours to just learn more, and I still did it. So I think it is possible. Um, all, it depends on the, the other circumstances in your life and the flexibility you have, but Ulrich uh, Bartholomew, who, who the German guy, who's won quite a few events, not the TCL, but quite a few other events. He's uh, like a management consultant and probably works 60, 70 hours a week. He gets up very early in the morning to go training. I, I know quite well, this is how I know. So, I do think it's possible to, and these are like, that's an example of someone who's doing very well. So it's, it's definitely possible to um, do it and, and work a full-time job. Maybe you can't achieve your full potential, but there are other things in life as well. But if you can find a balance to do both, then I think yes, definitely, without, without even a shadow of doubt. But it will just require sacrifice, isn't it? But for a year or two years, it's possible to make some. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else? Um, okay, so we've got some, uh, just a few, we'll do another Q&A and if anyone's got any extra questions, but um, just some sort of general questions about, you know, mindset, motivation. Um, so, um, you know, I think as cyclists, um, there's this sort of, I'm sure we'll start to see this idea of um, shocking yourself at, you know, what you're capable of, no matter what level you're cycling at, but that sort of addictiveness of, yeah, effectively shocking yourself. Um, and I'm interested to know what drives you on. I think it's sort of good maybe to look out of our sport for a little bit. And I know we've talked about this quote, but this is from Jasmine Paris. Um, she won the spine race, which is a, um, she's a very famous ultra runner um, across the Pen Am Way. And um, she broke the record um, by a long way. And she was at feed station. She was expressing milk for her relatively newborn child. It was just unbelievable. Um, but the, the quote is, it's exciting to push yourself to those limits. When you really experience things with everything stripped back, that's when you find out what you're made of or who you are. Those experiences give me a feeling of this is life, this is living. Everything else is just floating along. Uh, what is your biggest drive, James? Is it, is it being a racer? Is it this sort of constant need to shock yourself, to push yourself further? Yeah, it's a difficult question. It's sort of a very philosophical kind of you know answer. I think you know at the end of the day we all want to experience things from life, and we don't just want to go through life and exist. And and for me, doing this is a way to not exist and go beyond existence and actually live and feel. Um, there's so much more to it, like the challenge and achieving things, and just the love being outside. But it's it's really just being more than existing, and and, and living and, and feeling and doing things and. Yeah, I think the quote's really, really quite good. <laughs> do you, um, obviously in the moment it's, it's probably horrible, but in the, in the hardest, no. like, the moments if I the didn't enjoy hardship, doing this, I wouldn't do it. So you enjoy it in yeah. the moment, the, the, the hard parts where you're, yeah. well, not the bits where you're, you know, the diary and the other way, but yeah, where no, you're, but you're burnt existence. out, you're struggling to sort of, you know, pick a point ahead, and are you enjoying it then? Yeah, it's a, it's a privilege, isn't it, really? I get to go and ride my bike, and I choose to go out there and put myself through hardship. And I think that's something important to remind myself, is like, I chose to go here, I chose to do this. It's not suffering, I'm not like, it's not some, you know. I chose to just test myself against this event and see what I'm capable of. And it's, I, I went there to have fun and, and to test myself. And yes, it's difficult, but I went there for that difficulty to see, see what I can do. And if you remind yourself, of like, this is why I damn came here, because I wanted to see what I was capable of, I wanted something difficult, that's really important. You know, if you go there because you want to do something hard, and then it gets hard, and then like, oh, you know, this is too hard for me, well, that's why you went in the first place, to have something difficult, to test yourself, to see what you're capable of. 
to do more than exist. It's interesting that narrative in your head and how you probably rely on that, that constant idea of I'm here to enjoy it, I'm here, I know. I'm lucky to be here. I'm lucky to you're, be here. You're not gonna like. You're not gonna enjoy all of it, but you can take enjoyment from it. And and you have gone there for a reason. And when it gets hard, you need to remind yourself of that reason. Yeah. I think it's pretty obvious that you're you're clearly someone that possesses a pretty superior level of mental toughness. <laughs> um, is that something I, you think you? I still break down crying like the rest of us. It's, it's not too <laughs> That's good. <laughs> is that something you naturally possess, or you've had to work on? Um, I don't know, because it's like, it's a scale, isn't it? Is my scale the same as other people's scales, or is my scale different to other people's? I think there was a few things, like, I always remember when I was a young kid, and I'd go to the doctor, because your parents would take you to the doctor, because you had a problem. My mum would always, I'd always say, oh, it's really hard that much, or like, he'd go, oh, what is it? Or she goes, uh, what, it, what number out of ten is it? And I go, oh, that's about three. And I'd be fucking bleeding out or something. <laughs> and and, and so I, I always got told to add a couple of numbers to like the scale of whatever things are. But at the same time, like resilience isn't something that you have. You're not born with it. You you learn it either through like just having hard times in your life uh, uh, forcibly upon you. Like when you go through shit and you get through that, it's going to make you a bit stronger. Sometimes you choose it. Sometimes you choose to put yourself through it to to evolve. When I first started out doing this, I was nowhere near the level I am now um, because my experience of doing these things is growing and growing and growing and my zone of comfortable has, has got further and further. So, no, a lot of it's, a lot of it's, a lot of it's learn. I think pain and the tolerance for pain is, is probably a bit more personal, but you can also, you know, I don't know, become a Buddhist and embrace pain and it doesn't really exist. Um, so, yeah, you can teach it to yourself completely. Um, I was interested that, you know, you, you know there's going to be a, quite a lot of hardship on, the, on these events. They are grueling. And bef before a race, what are you doing sort of on the mental side to prepare yourself? Is there sort of a, um, a sort of tapering in of cutting out the luxuries in life? You know, maybe punching yourself in the face in the mornings or something. Um, or do you just go in and think, I mean, is it the, the match practice, if you like, or do you have a sort of a tapering in mentally? I eat the best food I can and sleep as much as I can. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy the luxuries while you can. Um, no, there's, not really. I, 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 in, 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 no, I don't really do anything special. I, I stop cycling as much. I will reduce stresses from my life. Uh, you know, I say to my wife, if there's some problems going on, just don't really tell me about them. If, if, you know, I, I, stop, I stop talking to my family members I don't really like, I, you know, yeah, I just try and reduce stresses, external stresses so that I don't really, when I go to the event and start it, I don't have anything going on in my head that's distracting me from what I want to be or need to be doing. So it's that sort of idea of being fresh in your mind, focused on the race, cutting other stuff out? Yeah, um, yeah, exactly, and because the way my brain works, if there is stuff going on, I can't shut it out by choice. Um, it, it just exists and it will bug me, so I need to just not know about it. Um, and I, and, and I, yeah, I say to my wife, if there's something going on or whatnot, don't, don't tell me about it. Although actually, when, when I raced the Highland Trail, she called me up three days in and said, oh, I'm pregnant, you know. <laughs> I said, oh, thanks, what are you waiting for distracting me while this is going on? But, yeah. Uh, yeah, try and reduce stresses, try and reduce other things going on and just focus on, on what you are trying to do. Remind yourself of why you're doing it. Make sure everything is in order. Go through your kit, go through your kit again, write some lists now, go get someone else to check out. You know, just make sure you've got your shit in line. Nothing's distracting you, so you can just focus on what you're trying to achieve. And I know that's again a luxury because there's not I try I, I can shut everything out and, and ignore people. Um, yeah. So um, obviously previously during TCR wins, for example, you lived in London, you were a student, and your training was uh, mainly involved in riding around yeah, the south of London and cramming in hours when you could. And um, you moved to Girona, but most recently you moved to sort of a very, um, the back of the Pyrenees, let, let's say. Um, and I think the idea of sort of, I'll get to it in a moment, but the idea of motivation and, um, Again, there's another quote here, Killian Journey, who I think holds just about every record there is in, in ultra running. He wrote, I don't understand the idea of I'm not motivated today. Some days are harder than others, but come on, 
it's such a luxury to be able to go out and enjoy the mountains. How can I not be motivated? Was moving to the very remote place that you live. Um, I remember Lloyd coming back from doing the film, he just literally said to me, James is a proper mountain man. As, <laughs> um, was that partly to do with this sort of idea of motivation? Did you have to be out riding every day, getting the base fitness? Was, it, was that the, the, the reason to be out there? Yeah, I mean, Killian and I now lives in a beautiful part of Norway, and I think if you live in a beautiful part of Norway, it's not really hard to motivate yourself, is it? I mean, you can't really say that. So it's a bit different if you live in South London, as I did. Like, you just have to go out and slog it out. Um, I moved to the Pyrenees because I always wanted to live in the mountains. I moved to the Pyrenees because I'm a simple person, and I'm not really built to live in a city with so much going on. It's too much for me, like, uh, you know, too much. So I just... I don't know, I, we have a wood boiler and I chop my wood and I put it in the boiler and it keeps us warm, you know, it's, it's a simple existence and that suits me as a person. It also just happens that it's a really great place to live if you're an athlete, for, for me anyway, I'm not someone who could live in Chamonix or something, I, I, I don't know. Not much happens where we live and it's, it's great, um, I have one neighbour and that's it. It's a, it's a simple existence and I can focus on the things that are important to me in life and that's just, you know, it's not, it's not like I go out and go training, I just go out and explore and enjoy nature and it's a privilege and I've you know, built my life around that to some detriment but I wake up and I, I'm, I'm happy and I, yeah, I live my life. And the, and the landscape's a big part of that for you? It's the peace, it's not the landscape, it's the peace. It's the peace. Yeah, yeah. it's the peace. You know, it's, I have to understand that other people like other things. My brother lives in Romford and he loves it, you know. And he, and he, he gets the train into a job in the city and he, he loves it. And it's for him, that's his piece. And, you know, we're all different people. But for me, living in a very remote place, you know, in the mountains, we live a thousand meters. And yeah, I have one neighbor and I have, you know, my family and we, we just live our little existence. And it's that peace and tranquility. The, 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 then I just go about doing what I do and what I love doing is just being outside and you know pushing myself and being athletic and it just it's not a I've, you know even when I lived in South London I had to make this distinction between motivation and commitment motivation is something that ebbs and flows and you're not motivated every day and I never am motivated every day I'm motivated maybe one day a week but I am committed every day, and I, I, by commitment you have a goal that you're working towards, like I want to achieve this, so what do I need to do to get there? And you just do that thing every day that you need to do to get there, and whether that's going, riding three, four hours, whether that's just like plugging away on some, you know, report for, for, for work or university or doing something you don't really want to do, you, you look at the bigger picture and it's commitment. And even now for me it's like, I'm committed to the things that I want to achieve in the longer term and you just do the thing you need to do every day to achieve that and you make small steps every day and eventually you're suddenly, you know, there. Hmm. I think it's interesting that, um, you know, you highlighted about that sort of pre-race, tapering in, clearing your mind. You talked about then being in the Pyrenees, clearing your mind and, you know, how much, how important the mind is to these races and you really focus on that clear-headedness and that focus, that's, that's really come through. Um, I mean, it is worth saying, you asked a question before about fitness and doing TCI and things, like for me, okay, you need to be fit to do these things, but like a club level cyclist is fit enough to do these things. It, it's in the head. It's really in the head. And if you're strong enough in the head, then you can get through it. Okay, you might get injured, you might get ill, stuff goes wrong, and for sure that happens, but it's in the head. After, after three days, I'm cycling so slowly that, that you know, anyone here would cycle past me. So it's, it's not physical, like, that's not what's going to get you through it to the end. You need the physicalness to, to be there, but it's the mental that gets you through it, and it's a really important distinction, because I think a lot of people get that confused, or they think it's all physical and they go really fast, or they use that, they're like, you need physicalness, and I'm not going to deny that, you can't just be unfit and do this, but you don't need to be some world-class athlete. You can just be a reasonably good athlete, club level cyclist, and you can do this if it's up here. It's interesting that because um, I sometimes feel you might, not, you might not come first. Don't, don't come back to yourself, Miss Soldier. I was just going to say, aim to finish and you'll be good. I sometimes feel there's a bit of an injustice around um, you know, people, maybe it's a sort of a, a sign of other things in life, you know, work harder than everyone else, but this idea that you can sort of. Yeah, that you can. 
out, you can just be mind alone, you can win these things. And I think it, obviously for uh, anyone here who wants to, who wants to try it, use the strength of mind, um, having not done it myself, I'm um, taking your word for it. Um, but, you know, I think the guys at the pointy end, you are, you know, you're incredible athletes as well. Um, and the yeah. speed you're doing out, the stats is just, you know, it's incredible, really. You don't have to answer that. I don't know, it, it's difficult. Like, <laughs> I, I see what I see, and I know I'm, like, gen a genetic outlier. Like, I was faster on a bike the first day I got on a bike than most people will ever be in their lifetime. And I know that, and I don't say that in an arrogant way. I say it in a, like, it's just not fair in life, for sure. So I don't want to disillusion people, but I also know that when I went to Silk Road this year, I was nowhere near as fit as I have been in the past. Like, I struggled to train this year because of like the past. I was like, well, what's the point putting in the work if I'm just gonna not be able to start or not gonna finish anyway? And I have a kid now who's very difficult and life's been very difficult this year, so I just wasn't as fit as I could be. In like, a, uh, you know, I don't know, paradise land or something, which doesn't exist, but mentally I was there. Yeah. Like I always checked in and I wanted to achieve it when I got there. Like when my wheels touched Kyrgyzstan and I started riding the first kilometers, that was it. Just the light turned on in my head. And it's that that's important. And people spend so much time training physically, they forget to work on these other factors that are so important. But I spend my time working on being like mentally strong. You know, I, I, I meditate every day, I spend time training hard every day, which builds my mentalness, you know. I spend time by myself, I, I do all these things to build mental strength as well as physical, and people forget to build that mental part. But it's that mental part that like, you can take into the rest of your life to be a better human being and to deal with all this other shit in the world. Uh, 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 and so it's like racing is this small thing over here, but actually the skills and things that I've learned from that translate so much into real life. And, uh, the resilience and stuff isn't just for cycling. Like if you learn resilience, like you know, I don't know, stuff happens over here. You can you can apply it over here. It's really interesting to hear how much you look after your mind. I didn't know that. It's so interesting. Um, this is my last question, and then we'll maybe do any more Q and A's if you want to ask. But just in one. So the last question, you know, um, going from road to mountain, and um, uh, having. Done both myself, originally a mountain biker and riding on the road, like a lot of a switch when road became you know, super popular. Um, in road riding, we sort of are, I suppose, our sort of bragging rights, our achievements is, you know, how far did you ride? Maybe for a certain level, how fast did you ride it? But usually it's not like, how far did you ride at the weekend? And that's your. In mountain biking, it's, that doesn't often come into the conversation. It's more about um, what was the trail you rode or the, the type of terrain you were riding. So it's more about the sort of so rather than riding further, you, the terrain gets bigger and bigger. Um, and there's kind of a sort of a, I suppose there's a sort of clash point there for an endurance cyclist like you, where, you know, you've been learning mountain bike, and I know you've been developing, and, you know, the way we talk about, you know, bikes and, you know, more travel, all the rest of it, that, um, you know, is there a sort of clash point in terms of having to go out and do the miles for the base fitness, but also, do you just want to have fun and increase your skills? Which, you know, they don't necessarily go together. I'm just interested to know about that. Yeah, I, I don't <laughs> go out and do the miles anymore. It doesn't exist, it's, no. I, I go out and just move. Uh, I've spent most of the past month just hiking. Like, I, I live in a really nice place and it's a pure luxury for me. I don't, you know, have to do the turbo training or this stuff anymore, but I've made that conscious decision to give up a lot of possibilities in life just to go and live somewhere to have this existence that I value. Um, but I just go out and move, whether that's like a one hour walk with my kid and my dog or like a six hour hike or a, you know, a six hour hike run or like a six hour mountain bike ride or a six hour, you know, I don't know, trudge through the wherever I've ended up. I just go out and move. And for me, that's with the racing that I'm doing now, that's enough. Sure, I couldn't go back and do time trialing anymore in such a way, but I can be fit enough and athletic enough to, to race at the level I need to, but also like mentally fresh enough and mentally strong enough because I'm just having fun and enjoying myself that I can achieve my best as well. And if I went out and just like had to train every day, it just wears you down. I think I'd have like three years left doing this before I just say fuck this and go and you know, get a job. Yeah. But I, I don't want to do that and so I just go out and move every day and do what I enjoy. Some days I wake up and I I don't want to do anything, so I don't do anything. Some days I wake up and I'm like, oh, I want to do, you know, I don't know, I don't really think I want to do this, so I don't plan. I just go out and go to the hills, and it might be dark by the time I get back. I don't, I don't know. 
Um, it's just having, it's just having fun. Like if you do have fun, it'll be longevity, you know. You won't yeah. be that person who gives up in three years. And just have fun. The uh, that wasn't intended to be the last. We just listening to you then reminded me of a, I had a question I missed, which was about the recovery. So you know, after Silk, um, after HD five fifty, just tell us about how you recover. Because I know you take, you purposely take time off the bike. You need to get away from it. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I actually, someone said to me today that it was eight weeks since Silk Road and I, I haven't ridden a bike in eight weeks, I guess. So I think maybe that makes sense. That was me when I first saw you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know, I just, I, 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 well, this year I was very sick and then I was fine and then I went hiking and walking and I just spent some time with my son and I spent some time with my dog uh, and we were just you know, moving in a different way uh, and I was just sick of riding my bike all the time and then I, was just waiting until one day I'll wake up and I think, oh, I just want to go ride on my bike again. And actually, I, yesterday or today, I sort of felt like that. And I think when I get home on, on Monday or Tuesday, I'll just start riding my bike again. And I don't force it. Like, I, I learned a long time ago that if you take a month, two months, three months off, it's not going to matter in the scale of years. And it's, it's important to be, like, mentally fresh. If I'm going to spend winter training hard and doing these other things, like, don't force yourself to do things you don't want to do. And for me, I'll just, I'll wait until I feel ready. Some, Times after an event, that's a week. Sometimes it could be, I don't know, I think like last year after Silk Road and when I didn't even get to race, I took like three months or four months from not really riding properly. I might have ridden a little bit, but not properly because I just, I just couldn't be bothered. And it didn't matter. Like, that's the fact. Like, just, you know, have yeah. fun. If, if you want it to be long term, have fun. I don't think you've always thought of that. It's interesting. I'm genuinely really um, interesting how your mind's changed uh, with the shift to offer and how you're able to sustain the sport you do. And I know that you're hoping to race for. When we spoke last. You're saying I'm going to do another ten years. Yeah, I have a friend. A friend of mine uh, is 63, and he comes riding and training with me, like six, seven hours in the mountains, doing 4,000 meter plus rides. And. I looked at him and I thought, he started quite late, so he hasn't done this for a long time, but I looked at him one day and I thought, fuck, if I'm like that when I was 60, I'll be happy. I'm not going to look at like, I'm not going to look at my results or what I've achieved, you know, winning races. I, I won't even care, I won't even remember. But I thought if I could still move like half like that when I'm that age, I'll be happy. And that sort of shifted like, oh, I don't need to or want to be like 100% on it right now because I want to be able to do that when I'm older. I don't want to pay the price for what I'm doing now. You look at a lot of pro athletes. You look at them when they're 50 or 60 and they are out of shape, unhealthy, not well. And I, I just, I don't want to be that person. I want to be healthy and I want to be enjoying moving when I'm older. And, and I, I'm willing to sacrifice a bit now to, to be able to be that when I'm older. Um, any more questions? That's the last of my questions. Any, uh, quite a few, right. Um, the lady just there, I think your hand was up first. Work really hard to persuade her. <laughs> <laughs> no, she fucking hated it here. <laughs> she 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 uh, she makes ceramics. She's gonna have a ceramic studio. Um, she just likes peaceful nature as well. So yeah, it wasn't even an issue. I was very lucky. Um, do you look at your bike? Are you wouldn't sorry, Do you love bicycles? I stare at it all night long. <laughs> but you know the thing where I mean, bicycles are beautiful things. But do you now look at them and think it's a torture instrument, or do you just look at it and still love them? Bikes have always been tools for me, uh, and I'm not precious about them in the slightest. I use them, I abuse them, and I get another one that I use and I abuse. And uh, sure, it, it looks nice, it's a cool colour, and I picked purple because I thought it was really cool, but it's a tool in the end of the day to allow me to do what I want to do. Um, I, I don't have like some old coal nargo hanging on my wall at home. No, it's a, it's a tool. I have to do what I want. It does look nice, though. Thank you. <laughs> um, the gentleman at the back. Uh, so, um, yeah, in the, the black, yeah. Um, it's, it's been having quite a lot of mental fortitude, so definitely how important do you value the comfort of your actual bicycle uh, when you're in fashion the bike? How do you value it? Yeah, a, a good, good question. The question is like, um, like, do I value having stuff that I know is not going to break? Is that, is that Pat? Oh, uh, good, good equipment. Comfort. Oh, comfort. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I wrote a few things about this and I said comfort's very important. And I run suspension when maybe you don't need to so that my hands don't get messed up. Like, again, I want my hands to work when I'm 60 and if I get nerve damage in every event I do, they're not. I have a friend in the US, in Seattle, his best friend is a hand surgeon, not anymore. 
because he, he messed his hands up riding long distance. So yeah, I value comfort because I, I think that our sport and this niche of it is so new that people don't understand the injuries and the long-term impact of that. Um, so I think it's very important, yeah. Is, is that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, several and several times. I have one like nearly every year. It, it, it like it doesn't change very often, but uh, maybe because of an injury, we move a little bit. But I think I, there are a lot of shady bike fitters out there. Like there are a lot of shady car mechanics out there. Sorry to all car mechanics uh, and bike fitters. But like, I can't recommend a bike fitter, but I know the ones that I trust that are like reputable, and I've seen some bad ones as well, so you need to be a little bit careful with that. But I really like saddle pressure mapping and hand stuff like this, I think it makes a big difference. So someone that understands that is very important. So follow just there, Keith's point is, yeah. yeah so, what, with the, talking about the bike, what, what went right and what went wrong? It, it, yeah, um, Be gentle. No, 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 I'm actually thinking. <laughs> oh, honestly, this year, this year I had, uh, yeah, this year I had, um, I had a small puncture on the front that sealed itself, and I had a slash in the rear that I had to put a plug in, and that was it. And nothing else. The only thing that like went wrong was that um, because I ran a um, this Thompson seat post, because it's so rough, I uh, like. I got a bit of bruising on my sit bones and I was a bit sore, but after a day or so it, it, it sort of disappeared and it was okay. I decided to run like a rigid seat post rather than like a little suspension one from Cancrete because um, it kind of comes back to a bit to your question. I was scared that it might break, like if it can break in Kyrgyzstan, it will break. And I, I've had a friend who had a, a, the bolt fall out of one of the cane creeks, and you know, so I was a bit worried about that. Would I ride one next time? Maybe I'd take that risk, but it is a risk there. So yeah, I would say nothing went wrong. What about equipment as well? Yeah, no, like nothing, no problem. I, I had, I ran the SRAM axis. I just charged the battery, swapped it. Like nothing went wrong at all. But it's, it's sort of experience of years and years of riding and understanding what breaks, what doesn't break, and then like every setup for each race is slightly different. And I know for this race, that's the right setup to run, and it's not going to break. Uh, chap in the red, just there. Thank you for uh, finding, thank you for inspiring for first of all these people. You. And uh, I hope all these people will like uh, preserve the nature that we want to find and we can explore. My question is about you talked about. Uh, one, commitment and motivation. Would you say that to get the best performance you should try to have a decent balance between these three factors, or would you add more? I think environment is important, and that's why I've moved to somewhere that's a good environment for me as a person, not just for like riding, but as a, as a human being as well. Like I'm not made to live in a city and in these other places or with people I'm made to live in like isolation in a quiet place in nature to be the best human I can be. And I think like if, you, if you're working, I know from work in the past, like you need to work in a team of people that are motivated and committed around you to the goal. If you work with a few people that are slackers, everyone's gonna start being a slacker, it's gonna piss you off. So you need environment is very important as well. And I think having that environment enables you to, to be committed every day because you're either with people or in the right place and you don't have to like work for it. It just happens naturally. And it's about creating like an environment where things happen naturally and organically rather than having to force it. You know, if you go to the gym and you do the spin class and like spin, 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 you know, it's so fake. But if you create an environment where you just want to ride your bike to go to work or or go for a run or you live in a nice place or that works for you and that looks different for everyone. It just happens organically and then you don't need to work for it and that's the best thing. And then it is fun and this other stuff. Uh, yes. So you've obviously gone from trans going off a road to mountain bike and off-road stuff. Yeah. You obviously helped Dol and Fairlight for the whole mountain bike part out great. It was all me. It was all, all <laughs> James. So Dol's party to your mountain He listens occasionally. <laughs> but um, in terms of moving forward, obviously people who ride mountain bikes get their own bikes and they find their new trails open up, they get a bit more exciting. Do you think you'll end up going back to something drop bar and racing something gravel because you don't want to challenge yourself more and maybe do off-road stuff? No, I go even further the other way, like enduro mountain biking. Like I, I spent a lot of my time now riding enduro trails um, and I think, yeah, I, I want to like put an enduro sort of 
bike packing event on, just to really mess people up. So, I, I don't know, no, I, don't, I can't remember the last time I rode a drop bar bike. I think if you, I think it's not, like if you're riding easy terrain, it's not about the bars riding, it's about the tires and how strong you are as a rider, so it doesn't really matter. People are confused that the bars are gonna make you faster, no, it's really the tires or how strong you are, so. And no, it's, it's not like, I, I ride that sort of terrain to go to more interesting places, to see more interesting things, to experience more interesting stuff. So it just, no. It was, um, when we met earlier, and we got the bikes out of the car, we got the rigid halt out there, the, the second one, the moss colour, and the first thing you said to me is, I was thinking of maybe, uh, Getting rid of this account and building this as my gravel bike. It's interesting that mindset that you see yourself as a mountain bike now, flat handlebars. Um, and also the idea, especially the terrain that you're on, even the gravel is hardcore, and that maybe um, in terms of the descending, you're gaining so much and not losing a huge amount in terms of the climbs and the sort of longer sections. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I, yeah. I just like enjoying riding my bike to go and see things nowadays. He concurs. Oh. <laughs> um, any more questions? Yes. It's an event in Northern Italy. It's like a four days event. It's similar to that. It's a little bike with kind of self navigation sort of thing, would you consider actually doing that? Well, what's it called? Uh, Trans Baraita. Trans Baraita is like a Bali Northern Northern. I have not heard of this, but I'm, I'm interested. Send me, send me a message with it. Yeah, please do. <laughs> if you send me a link, I'll have a look. I haven't heard of it before. I'd like to hear about it. Thank you. It's a four-day event with uh, kind of self navigation and night, night stages as well. It sounds fun. Any other questions? If you can say, what is the next objective in terms of race you have in your mind? Uh, Highly trail 550 and then the Silk Road again. Unfinished business. <laughs> yeah. Oh, more. Um, Lloyd, so just a uh, Lloyd, Lloydie? I have a question. Uh, so there's a lot of events now that are kind of like not letting you ride at a certain time, like the, you know, it's like, people are kind of saying, people who win are the people that ride 24 hours a day, you know? so it's like, how do you feel about people putting like a cap on the endurance of a person, basically, it's like, because the endurance race is riding as long as you can ride, and if you start saying it's like a state race, or there's a, there's a time frame to ride, how do you feel about that as a, as a limitation as you as an athlete? So your question is like, uh, how do I feel about people making races and riders sleep at night time effectively? Yeah, like saying... Or stop, or stop. Yeah, you know, 7pm you stop racing now and you stop racing. Now. I don't know, then it just becomes a stereotype race like the Tour de France. It's just, yeah. But <laughs> honestly, my, my opinion is I don't really give a shit because everyone's the race director of their own race or event and they can make the rules up and if I want to go there or not, I have that free choice. If I don't like it, I just won't go. Um, I don't really mind about it. Like, honestly, it would probably benefit me because I'm not the best at sleep deprivation. Uh, I, I need to sleep every day. But I think it's more like on the road, and it, you know, there is this balance of um, responsibilities. And if you're really sleep deprived and riding on the road, and there are cars who's responsible for someone getting killed, and that's ambiguous. Off road, if I kill myself riding off a cliff, it's my fault, really, and I'll take that on the chin. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I see it more like I see it more like other man, you know, road racing on motorbikes and things like this. Northwest 200, you know, if you kill yourself doing that, you chose to down I'd be there and you knew what the choices were. And if I'm riding off road, if I kill myself, it's my choice. I would happily race a race that made me sleep for a few hours at night time nowadays, but I also don't think it's particularly safe at times because you can end up forcing people to stop and maybe there's a storm or they're in a difficult terrain. And I don't think all event organizers have thought that aspect through fully. Um, personally, I'll just leave it open because if people are responsible adults, then they're going to stop and sleep because, you know, their health and safety is more important to them than coming first. And Marin uh, saint Exupéry just won Atlas Mountain Race and slept every day and, and other people didn't. Um, and I think, you know, we can see phenomenal athletes doing things while they are still being responsible adults as well and being the best. Uh, was a, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Still crying, Mountain Race, no sort of life. 
Yeah, it's a good question. The Tour Divide is something that's stuck in my head for a few years now, and it, and it circulates, but actually, like, I don't know, the further I get from the first time that I thought about it, the less interested I am. It seems more like a gravel plug across the USA. And I hear stories of cars pushing people off roads, and some weird stories of, like, people going into, I sort of read these stories, like, not people being shot at, but, like, going into, like, a, what we'd call it, like, a bothy or a refuge, and there being people shooting off guns and stuff, so I don't know. I think it's there, but I also see myself like probably, I don't know, getting the tandem and going with my wife and touring it more than like racing across it. Perhaps it's just nicer to enjoy that way, I'm not sure. Uh, one more question maybe? Anyone got? Yeah, go for it. So DNFs are part of auto racing, even at the pointy end of the race, right? Uh, what, what, what are the biggest lessons you, you, see, you can say you learn from your own DNFs? Don't, don't get in a taxi with someone that might have COVID two days before a race. <laughs> um, that was one. Don't take a rain jacket from a brand that makes shit rain jackets. That was another one. Um, the other one, don't, 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 uh, I, going back to the first TCR, would be like, don't be arrogant and think you're better than you are. Just have a, be sensible, especially in the early days of an event. Don't push yourself too hard. You, you're going to be very fit, probably because you've trained hard. You're going to be very fresh because you've rested. You're going to not be able to gauge how strong you are, so you need to ride easy. It's going to take a long time, so you know, embrace riding easy in the beginning to have energy left at the end to spend it then. Don't spend it all at the beginning. Um, and that's probably the biggest mistake that I see people making time and time and time again, because they go out so hard and so fast in the beginning forgetting that it's going to take so long. I, I will go out easy in the beginning. I will never be fast at the beginning because it's a waste of energy. Save that and spend it at the end when other people are fucked. Yeah. And it will get you to the finish. Um, I think that's probably it. Um, there was one, did was you want to ask a question? Ah, sorry. Uh, yeah, sorry, uh, I knew you checked out the road circuit, but... Um, yeah, sorry to everyone that has to ride right here. I don't mean to let me in now. But. Going back to the TCR, like I've been watching it the last few years, I was watching it when you won it, um, and I've noticed more of the riders are fully sponsored, they train full time, and it kind of hurts me, like, it seems a bit unfair to the amateur riders who maintain a full time job, but it's putting in a, a lot of work as well, but it's kind of two races going on at the same time, there's, there's pros, you could call them, and, and amateurs, how do you feel about that? Yeah, I think it's a good question. I, you know, I was joking with someone, this lady in the US the other day, because, you know, some, some events do, like, first woman finishes, some don't. And we were, I, was, I was sort of asking, well, who's going to be considered first? Are we going to start doing first amateur soon, you know? Do we deserve that distinction as well? Because it is a big distinction. But at the same time, even in TCR this year, the guy who technically came second on the road, um, I think Adam, uh, he's, well, he's a bike messenger, but that's a job, isn't it, right? Okay, he rides his bike, but probably doesn't make much money, so fair pay to him. Um, Powell is a bike messenger, has a family, has two kids, um, and runs an event. He was third. Ulrich was fourth or fifth. He works 60, 70 hour weeks so on management consultant and maybe takes some time off and works hard. So there are these people that are like working full time, they're also achieving a lot. Uh, Liam. Um, Liam Glenn, no, Liam Glenn, who, who kicked my ass in the Highland Trail uh, last, last year um, and, and nearly took the record, uh, is a full time engineer. So I agree with you that there are more people like me, but I'm also getting my ass kicked by people who have full time jobs. And, and I think, like, I wouldn't separate it right now because I think that's really cool to see. And personally, I'm like, wow, that's amazing, you know? It's a bit embarrassing, but it's amazing. It's the upside of it, right, for us. How many sports can you actually race against the people at the top? Yeah, I think maybe we should like sometimes go off. M maybe in a few time years we'll have to go first amateur, but also you know, I know, he knows, like, and, and I have a lot of respect for that. And I think at the moment, like, it's still competitive because some people are just phenomenally good. <laughs> um, yeah. I think it's cool for the sport as well, though, because it keeps raising our level up and, and eventually maybe it will be sort of separated and I don't know what's going to happen, but I think if the level keeps getting higher and higher, it's exciting for, for everyone, I hope. Um, and maybe it will split, I don't know. Any more? Thank you, James. That was... Oh, thank you. It was great. So many questions. Thank you very much.